Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Hello, America. It's the third hour of the program. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number is 877-973-7425 if you want to be on the program. I got an email from a buddy of mine. Now, this is dangerous because it, it will... So I, I got I to gotta tread carefully in how I... I deal with this because it will incentivize. He doesn't understand. He doesn't appreciate. It will incentivize a level of harassment he has never seen. If I am not careful to avoid identifying him, I, I one time mentioned a friend of mine on this radio program. And to this day, he sometimes says he regrets knowing me because of the number of people who now reach out to him and ask him to feed me information, but a, a, a friend of mine made a good point that when I talk about the media and the press, I should point out that one of the most conservative areas of the press are local newspapers. I'm not talking about uh, the regional papers like the Atlanta Journal-Constitution or even uh, the McClatchy owned Macon Telegraph or or the Charlotte newspaper or uh, the Austin, Texas newspaper. But, you know, a lot of counties and states have newspapers. And those tend to be very plugged into the local level and tend to be fairly conservative. Uh, their editorialists tend to be fairly conservative. There's a great one near me uh, that I subscribe to, and it, it's a once a week newspaper. And it primarily covers its county, and it has been relentless in exposing a woke takeover of its local school board, among other things. Uh, and those are necessary outlets. And frankly, if you are a conservative, those are the sorts of uh, press operations you should be subscribing to. If you have a local county paper, you should get a subscription to it. One, uh, you're, you stay in the know about what's going on in the county wherever you live, and two, you are actually supporting a conservative enterprise in doing so more often than not. I'm not going to say they all are, but overwhelmingly, the county-by-county county newspapers, they also tend to be profitable operations. That's something else. As much of the media is dying, a lot of these local uh, newspapers, county-wide newspapers, tend to still turn a small profit. Uh, operations have been disrupted. Uh, printing shops have been disrupted and the like, but they're still pretty good. And uh, they're they're worth they are worth supporting. Uh, I I got to tell you my local one that I get a subscription to. It's uh, one county north of me, uh, Monroe County in Georgia, and its local newspaper shop has just been tenacious exposing uh, its local school board so much so that the the former I think former I don't think it's current now I think he left former superintendent was like ostracizing the newspaper publisher's kids. And the publisher just doubled down on exposing just how woke and far left and out of touch with the community the school board was and has been able to make real change just by reporting the facts, not editorializing, just reporting the facts. They're useful services. So when I paint with that brush, I must, must not be as broad as I might be. And that's a necessary corrective. Now, I want to talk about the fair tax. Brace yourselves. It is a dangerous thing for me to talk about the fair tax. Of all the radio show hosts on the North American continent, I am the one who should tread most carefully. The reason being is I got my start at WSB Radio in Atlanta, Georgia, still my flagship station and employer. And for a very long time, several decades, 
the flagship voice of my flagship station was a friend of mine named Neil Bortz, who, along with John Linder, former congressman in Georgia, championed an idea called the Fair Tax. They wrote numerous books about it. Uh, They served as apologists for the idea. The Fair Tax is essentially a national sales tax. I I am taking some shortcuts. Those of you who are devoted to the Fair Tax, just show me some grace here. I'm trying to explain it for a national audience, many of whom are not familiar with the Fair Tax because it's been a while. The fair tax is essentially a national sales tax that would impose, I think it's a 35% sales tax across the nation, would give prebates to people of a certain income and uh, or income threshold, whereby the government would give you at the start of the year money to help you make ends meet uh, in lieu of the, because of the sales tax. But this is key point, key point on the fair tax. The fair tax would not go into effect under its own terms until the income tax amendment to the Constitution was repealed. You would not get the fair tax until the income tax amendment was repealed. The 16th Amendment to the Constitution uh, is the taxation amendment. The 16th Amendment to the Constitution uh, says in part, uh, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on income from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. According to the fair tax, the fair tax would replace the income tax. It would not be in addition to the income tax. It would be a replacement of. And the theory was the income tax is overly burdensome and complex, requires an army of accountants. People have to have withholdings from their paychecks and that while everyone would see their costs go up on purchases and service costs because the fair tax would apply to services as well, that um, you actually would overall see a boost to the economy to people's incomes because there would no longer be a withholding of income from people's paychecks. And those who were above the income threshold would get a prebate check in the mail, either yearly or monthly, to help offset the costs of the fair tax. Therein lies my charitable explanation of the fair tax. It was promoted for years by Neil Bortz and John Linder, among others. Uh, There were a couple of other groups out there that claim it's 23%, not... 32, just clearing that up. Thank you to um, Randall for email. 23% was the fair tax rate, not 32%. Um, There are others who claim the fair tax as their own, which always kind of drove me crazy. People would reach out to me and claim that Neil Bort stole the idea from him. It's possible two people came up with the uh, same idea separately. But what I can tell you is that no one did more work to advocate for it than Neil Bortz, the retired radio talk show host. The fair tax never came to be. And the fair tax never came to be for a particular reason. You are never, you will not ever get two thirds of both houses of Congress and three quarters of the states to repeal the 16th Amendment. It is just not going to happen. You will be making babies on Mars before the 16th Amendment is repealed. It's just not going to happen. And so when people submit the fair tax, what they do is they open the Republicans up to a tax that they want to raise sales taxes on the poor without doing anything about the income tax. Never mind the actual language of the legislation. Never mind that. So it has become a nuisance to the right more than a help to the right to rethink taxation. My personal preference, if I were king for a day, would be to impose a flat tax. That everybody in this country pays the exact same tax percentage, which means the rich would pay more than than the poor, but we wouldn't have a progressive tax code. We would just have a very simple, you pay 10% of all your income over $30,000 to the federal government. 
Doesn't matter whether you make 500000 or 40000 or a uh, billion dollars. You pay 10% to the federal government. 10% is good enough for God. It should be good enough for the federal government. You could do the entire tax code on a postcard, and away we go. But we have a progressive tax code, and our progressive tax code gets overly complicated over time. It's probably time for another bipartisan committee to simplify the tax code because the tax code, I think, is bad uh, because, in large part, you, you've got a, a tax code that has created whole industries of accountants and others. The tax code is supposed to be about raising money for Washington. Instead, government treats the tax code as a way to get you to conform your life in certain ways. I say scrap it, start over, give us a flat tax, not a fair tax. But for advocates of the f- uh, fair tax... They want to vote on it in Congress. It is a zombied piece of legislation that no one has thought about in a number of years. But Buddy Carter, who is a congressman from Georgia, he's of a certain generation that remembers when the fair tax was a thing. And he's decided he wants Congress to vote on it. And Kevin McCarthy promised in exchange for his vote, he would put it to a vote. Americans for Tax Reform, run by Grover Norquist, and the Wall Street Journal editorial board are denouncing the vote on the fair tax. The reason they're denouncing the vote on the fair tax is a good reason. It's not going to pass, so why set Republicans up for a tax by Democrats that they want to raise taxes on the poor? Those are fair points. This is a gift that keeps on giving. Americans for Tax Reform argues it's oxygen for Democratic attacks on Republicans, that it is essentially a crank idea at this point that has never gotten traction, is opposed by an overwhelming majority of Republican lawmakers, and undermines by advancing it legitimate tax reform issues. For a number of years when I was on just WSB radio, I I would go to live events. I need to do more live events. I haven't done them in a while, but I would uh, get people who would come up to me and say, what do you think of the fair tax? Don't you like the fair tax? You never talk about the fair tax. They would want me to champion the fair tax. I've never been a fan of the fair tax, to be honest with you. I've tried to treat it fairly out of respect for my friendship with Neil Bortz and and the merits of it. Uh, But I personally think that... um, you're never going to repeal the 16th Amendment, so there's no never been a reason to advance the fair tax. Grover Norquist thinks it's a bad idea. People got asked about uh, that if it was a Republican position. It's from one guy, uh, and yet the entire Republican Party will be tarred with it, according to Grover Norquist. Some Republicans believe Americans for tax reform and other fair tax opponents are worrying too much about any political problem, even if they get the instinct to come out swinging against ideas that would make Republican lawmakers sweat if they hit the House floor. Norquist seems interested in essentially salting the earth against the fair tax, telling Weekly Tax that he'll be lobbying the roughly two dozen House Republicans on the bill to publicly distance themselves from it uh, and when it fails. Otherwise, Norquist says, the fair tax could again distract from one of the Republicans' primary purposes— to push for income tax cuts when they control the government and oppose income tax increases when they don't. That's Norquist's position. Maybe I need to get Grover on here to talk about this. Um, It is at this point an, an idea past its time and that Buddy Carter, a Republican from Georgia, would spin the entire House Republicans up on voting for something that's not gonna pass the House, let alone pass the Senate, let alone turn into law, Uh, seems like a real distraction from the fact that we do have an income tax code that has fundamental problems that we should address. And this distracts from that and gets Republicans beat up in the meantime. It just seems to be really dumb politics from a congressman from Georgia. If you own a small to medium-sized business that kept employees on payroll through COVID, you may have a big cash refund waiting for you. The Employee Retention Credit is a tax credit of up to $26,000 per employee, and now more businesses than ever qualify. The experts at RefundsPro.com specialize in cutting through the red tape of qualifying for this government program. Most of their refunds are over $100,000. 
even businesses that have received PPP funds may be eligible. And there are absolutely no fees unless you receive a refund. There's no reason not to apply. If your business experienced shutdowns, limited capacity, supply chain challenges, or even reduced revenue due to COVID, you likely qualify. RefundsPro.com has already helped hundreds of businesses. So don't lose the refund you're owed by missing the deadline. Get started today with the free five-minute questionnaire at refunds with an s refundspro.com that's refunds with an s pro.com hello there it is eric erickson here the phone number is 877-973-7425 if you want to be on the phone happy to have you i i, I will just l- let me say one more thing here on this fair tax fight that i i i would rather a fair tax or a flat i my preference is a flat tax because I think it's more realistic uh, than getting rid of the 16th Amendment. But I would prefer a flat tax or a fair tax to the current income tax structure. I just realistically, uh, people have been arguing about the fair tax for a number of years, and it's kind of at an end. And I just personally think that we don't have a that um, we don't have a, a structure within the House of Representatives or the Senate to get the fair tax passed. So why get Republicans to vote on something that is not going to pass the House? Enough Republicans are opposed to it. It's not going to pass the House. But you are going to get the Republicans uh, attacked for wanting to put a sales tax on the poor without any nuance from the press over the details of it. It's not going to pass the Senate. Why, when you've only got a five or six person majority, strategically waste time on the fair tax, which doesn't have buy-in even from the fiscal conservative members of the House Republican Caucus right now, who think it's kind of an old idea uh, that doesn't need to be resuscitated. Uh, And the only reason is because you got uh, Buddy Carter in the U.S. House, who was able to get a commitment from Kevin McCarthy, a 65-year-old uh, from the southeast coast of Georgia, wants the fair tax vote, so he gets the fair tax vote that isn't going to go anywhere and gets Republicans beat up. It's just kind of it, – it's if you're going to get Republicans beat up for something that isn't going to pass, at least make it more meaningful. Make it like closing the border, real immigration reform, something that also won't pass the Senate – but will actually have real valuable messaging as opposed to the fair tax. It just seems like a wasted vote to me. And again, I would prefer the fair tax to the current tax structure, but I also like maintain a level of realism in my life that it's not going to happen. 877-973-7425. If you want to um, want to call in, I, have you heard about the Fox News meteorologist Adam uh, Klotz? He was on a subway train. And got beat up. He had been to the Giants NFL playoff game at a bar. Uh, He saw an older gentleman being hassled by a group of seven or eight teens on the subway train. He said, guys, cut it out. um, And they turned on him and beat him up. uh, Battered his ribs. Punched him in the face. He's got two black eyes. And the police let the kids go because they're all under the age of 18 and probably will not press charges against them, according to the police department, that they may go to the probation office if Adam Klotz wants to file a report with the probation office. Now, this gets me to a story uh, Philip highlighted earlier today. Uh, Juvenile crime is surging Violence among children has soared across the country since 2020, uh, all with a mounting toll of young victims. A 13-year-old boy ran through the Bronx streets one May afternoon last year, chased by two teens on a scooter. Surveillance video showed him frantically trying to open the doors of an assisted living facility. Scooters peeled on the sidewalk, sped towards him. They pointed a handgun at him, a 15-year-old boy did, and fired several times. This is happening more and more. Just what a what a disaster out there with youth crime in this country. Greetings, welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone lines are open. 
7425 should you wish to be on the program you are more than welcome to be now i gotta play you some audio this is from robert costa he was on cbs this weekend it's about the debt ceiling what i'm told from people inside the west wing is that president biden himself has a relationship with Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, of course, with Chuck Schumer, the Senate Democratic leader. They are in some ways going to try to cut out Speaker Kevin McCarthy and the House Republicans. There's not an appetite among Democrats to put spending cuts on the table at all. They would like to see a clean debt limit extension. And Jim Clyburn, one of the top Democrats in the House, recently told me he could see a scenario where centrist House Republicans band together with House Democrats for a clean debt limit extension. The Biden administration is being foolish with the debt ceiling. They have the New York Times out spinning, claiming only Republicans politicize it, which is not true at all. I don't know why we have a debt ceiling. It's it's probably a good thing, though, to force these conversations. Republicans, if we're honest, if we are truly honest, Republicans only care about spending in Washington, D.C., when Democrats control the White House. That's it. It's the only time Republicans care about spending. But uh, that irregular time is actually far better than nothing because our national debt is ridiculous. I'm looking right now. National debt total right now. The U.S. national debt clock, not the deficit clock. The deficit clock is, oh, great googly moogly. Um we are at thirty-one trillion five hundred seven billion six hundred fifty-four million three hundred thousand dollars in debt. Now we're at um, that four hundred thousand. It just it goes up uh, every four or five seconds. It goes up another uh, hundred thousand. That's how fast the debt is. Uh, tax revenue for the federal government right now is $4.6 trillion, $13,788 per American. It is incredible. Debt per citizen in the United States right now is $94,240, but not every citizen pays taxes. So the debt per taxpayer, according to the U.S. debt clock, is $246,000. 867. In 1960, the debt to GDP ratio was 53.3%. In 1980, it was 34.5%. In the year 2000, it was 59.4%. Right now, it is 121.5%. In other words, Our debt now exceeds our GDP for the first time in American history. These are not stable numbers. These are not stable numbers at all. This is very bad for the country. And right now, the value of assets in the U.S. continues to go up, but the total household assets in the United States goes down. Assets per citizen are 538589 If you took all the assets of all American citizens and you sold them right now, you would get roughly $142.7 trillion, enough to pay off the national debt, but that means you would be confiscating all property of all Americans to be able to do it. It's not sustainable. If you taxed all Americans 100% of their income, you could not pay off the national debt. You would not even make a dent in the national debt. This is completely unsustainable. Cuts have to happen. Y'all, it's kind of a no-brainer at this point. And let me just put this in perspective. Listen, yes, could you raise taxes to make a dent in the national debt. You could raise taxes to make a dent in the national debt. The problem, however, is we have a slowing economy and outside of uh, a few nuts 
most mainstream economists on the left and the right acknowledge that if you raise taxes in a slowing economy, you slow the economy further. Uh, the Federal Reserve is trying to uh, land a plane. It is trying to land our economy slowly to stop inflation without crashing the economy. You add a tax increase into the mix of interest rate hikes, you're going to crash the economy and have a very bad recession. You have to deal with the national debt. There are a few ways you can deal with it. You can raise taxes, you can cut spending, and you can grow your economy so significantly you boost tax revenue to Washington. What we would like to do is grow the economy, except our economy is retreating. While it is retreating, you don't want to raise taxes because it retreats even harder and causes more trouble. So you got us, you got to cut spending. We are uh, spending more than we have as a nation right now. Our debt exceeds gross domestic product at 121.5%. Again, you can raise taxes. You can cut spending, and you can grow the economy so much that it boosts federal uh, revenue. If you increase taxes, if you raise taxes, not cut taxes, if you raise taxes right now to make a dent in the national debt or to boost revenue to Washington, D.C., you're going to hurt the economy anymore. That's just basic economics the left and the right agree on. So what are you going to cut? We've got to cut something. We have got to cut something. And Republicans in Washington are willing to cut something. I don't know what they want to cut, but they want to cut something. We need to cut something. The White House is claiming that it will accept no cuts. Now, you should know the Republicans, when they have controlled Congress and the Democrats have controlled the White House, have never, ever gone along with a clean debt ceiling increase. For Joe Biden to say that's what he wants is not a workable solution. There is one path forward for them, and that is for moderate Republicans and the whole of the Democratic Party to come together and force it to the floor of the House of Representatives. There is a way to do that, to bypass the Rules Committee and get it to the floor of the House of Representatives. You have to do a petition to get it to the floor of the House of Representatives. If they do that and they raise the debt ceiling and we continue to blow through the debt ceiling gap, they're just going to make our fiscal situation in the country worse. Now is the time to figure out what you're going to cut. They've got to cut. And I don't know what they cut. Donald Trump is out saying don't cut Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. That's a great place to cut. I don't understand why why Bill Gates needs Social Security. Why does Warren Buffett need Social Security? Why does Elon Musk, the richest, one of the richest men on the planet, not anymore the richest, why does he need Social Security? Jeff Bezos, why? Why should all of these people get Social Security? Why can't we means test Social Security at this point? That would save a massive amount of money and refund the system, reform the system. It doesn't make sense to me why we're not means testing Social Security. You and I are probably not going to see Social Security. It's bankrupt. You want to solve the issue. You want to solve the problem and fix Social Security means test it. The idea that a billionaire, listen, the Democrats right now believe that they should be able to uh, make the wealthy pay a wealth tax that is based on their hypothetical earnings that they made when the stock market goes up. Never mind the stock market may go down. The Democrats want them to pay money on a hypothetical amount of money, but yet they don't want to means test Social Security. That seems to me to be a no-brainer to help fix the system and resolve some of the debt problems. But also, there are cuts you can do even to the military. There are some cuts you can do. There are cuts to social programs you can do. There are cuts to the education department you can do. I don't know why we have to have all these departments in our government uh, merge uh, education and labor get together, get rid of the labor department, merge it with commerce department, something. There are things you can do to save money in Washington. No one wants to do them because it's easier to go along to get along and just keep raising the debt ceiling. But we're headed off a fiscal cliff. Something must be done. And I hope they do it. Now, that gets me to another issue here, the Club for Growth. The Club for Growth has decided to start picking some fights again, and we're all better off because of it. 
During the Trump administration, the Club for Growth kind of took a back seat to Donald Trump and, and let Trump make the calls. They didn't want to provoke him. They didn't want to pick a fight with him. They had picked fights with him and lost in the 2016 primaries. But at this point, it's actually a sign of a return to not just normalcy, but good fiscal stewardship from the Club for Growth that they're willing to pick some of those fights. They have defied Donald Trump on some candidate picks. And now they're going all in on Jim Banks in Indiana. If you're a nah, 40-something and older conservative, there was a time you were probably enamel, enamel, enamored with Mitch Daniels. Mitch Daniels had been George W. Bush's head of the Office of Management and Budget. He was all about reining in the size of the federal government. When war broke out after 9-11, he really couldn't do that anymore, and, and Republicans were tired of having to fund domestic initiatives. And people forget that Republicans funded the war effort but did not fund the domestic efforts, which is why the debt went up so much under George Bush. It wasn't the war. It was the domestic spending. Daniels had enough. He went home, became governor of Indiana, was a very good governor until he decided to declare a truce on social issues. Didn't want to have to run on those icky social issues. He left the governor's mansion. Mike Pence thereafter took over. Mitch Daniels became the head of Purdue University and managed Purdue University fairly well. He's now left and thinking of getting back into politics. The rumor is he wants to run for the United States Senate. Jim Banks, friend of mine, congressman from Indiana, he's running for the U.S. Senate. I have invited Jim Banks to our gathering in August. The Club for Growth has just jumped in with Jim Banks out of the gate, as they should. Listen, uh, I at one point in my life was enamored with Mitch Daniels, but are you telling me I got to pick a 73-year-old to go to the Senate when I can have a 43-year-old who has never suggested compromising social conservatism? Good for the Club for Growth. Um, the club has also commissioned some polling. Uh, their last poll showed that Donald Trump would do pretty well in the nation, except in Georgia. Their latest polling shows he'd do badly in Georgia, and also Ron DeSantis would beat him in Florida. At this point, Donald Trump is focused on Donald Trump, and David McIntosh is focused on saving the country. Those are two different things, and I'm glad to see the Club for Growth stepping back into the arena as the most consequential uh fundraising powerhouse on the right for fiscal conservatives. You know, I've said for years, if you want to find out who the best pro-lifers are in Washington, you should actually look at the Club for Growth scorecard, not the National Right to Life scorecard. No offense to the National Right to Life, uh, but they, for years, also tried to maintain some bipartisan street creds, and the Club for Growth just didn't care. They were going for fiscal conservatives, and you, if you are a fiscal conservative, you do not think Washington should pay for abortions, even if you're pro-choice. So they ultimately had one of the best pro-life scorecards in the country. The Club for Growth was the very first organization I ever gave money to politically. More than any others, the Club for Growth, when I started earning money, I backed the Club for Growth. In fact, Congressman Jeb Henserling from Texas was the very first political candidate I ever gave money to. And he was a Club for Growth pick. Club for Growth has a great record of picking good candidates. I'm glad they've thrown in with uh, Jim Banks in Indiana, it looks like they are looking at Ron DeSantis. And that's good. Club for Growth will spend eight figures or whatever it takes to get Jim Banks elected, uh, says Joe Kildea at the Club for Growth, and they should. They're also looking at Alex Mooney in West Virginia. He would be a great pick in West Virginia against Joe Manchin. Uh, I've got a little bit of hesitation with Matt Rosendale simply because he's lost a tester before uh, in Montana, but otherwise the club, I think they and I tend to align on these things. I'm glad they're jumping in. And if you're interested um, in signing up with fiscal conservatives and getting in early on the ground floor of a great campaign, you could do no better than Jim Banks running for the Senate in Indiana. And also I've just, yes, use this segment as Republicans go wobbly on the debt limit and the debt ceiling and all that. The club for growth wants to hold them accountable and we need more accountability on the right for this stuff. With Donald Trump no longer there, a lot of the organizations on the right who took a back seat to Trump's agenda are putting their foot forward again, and we should be thankful that David McIntosh and the club are among them because we got a $31, $32 trillion national debt. No one on the left is interested in paying it down. Too few on the right are, and we should rally around the organizations that actually are interested in fiscal sanity, and the club's one of them. This is not an ad but it is an endorsement of the group. Now, 
Let's take a time out and we'll be back and I'll squeeze in a few more phone calls. Hello there, my friends. It is Eric Erickson here. I would like to squeeze in a phone call right now. Let's go to Drew. Welcome to the show, Drew. How are you? I'm doing well. Good afternoon, Eric. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. I've been a uh, sporadic or periodic listener for the past several years, but I'm trying to become more regular. So my apologies if you have already covered this and I have missed it. But uh, it seems like so many of the issues that our nation is facing, particularly those that are compounded by decisions made or decisions neglected by our so-called leaders in Washington, D.C., could be remedied by a convention of states. So I have two questions for you. The first is, what's your prognosis for a convention of states uh, being called and in what time frame? And then secondly, what could you and perhaps other conservatives with a large reach or large audience do to expedite seeing a convention of states come about? You know, I will tell you, I've gone back and forth on the convention of states and where I have landed on convention of states is, uh, you know, we might as well see if we can clean up Washington by having one. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, convention of states, it is in the amendment process of the Constitution that two thirds of the states can petition Washington, D.C. to uh, allow a convention of the states. The hesitancy on doing so has been an untested idea that. If you restrict it to an agenda, must it keep the agenda? And the reason there's hesitancy there is because the Articles of Confederation were um, problematic and they called a convention of the states to fix them. And instead of fixing, they wound up with a whole new document, the Constitution. So there's some constitutional fear of can we call a convention of the states where we set an agenda and say these are the only things you talk about and uh, rush them through or must it be wide open and we could out of this get some new document as a constitution. Well, at this point, I think, why not go on and risk it? Um, let, let the states do it. We got three quarters of the states would have to pass anything. So if three quarters of the states chose not to, make sure everything has an expiration date on them when they come out um, and see if we can fix stuff. Majority of the states of this nation lean to the right. So California and New York may say no, and we may get through three quarters of the state saying yes, and California and New York say, well, we're going to go our own way then. This union is over. Um, I just fundamentally think we're there are things our government needs to do in fixing the Constitution. One is to rein in the Commerce Clause that's been used by judges too broadly. Another is to require a balanced budget without uh, court intervention. That is, if Congress fails to balance it, the court can't come in and balance it for the legislature. Um, and the preference needs to be towards tax reform that doesn't increase taxes. Um, it, there are things we can do. I, I, I love the, the Tabor idea of restricting the growth in government based on population and inflation and the like that some states have. That's a great idea. Uh, putting explicitly in the Constitution that abortion is not in the Constitution or supporting the pro-life cause. There are things we can do and... Might as well try. The problem is, like the fair tax, I don't know that it's going to happen. There's more momentum for it, but the votes don't appear to be there in two thirds of the states to get it done because too many legislators feel like you're playing with fire to do something like that. So I wouldn't hold my breath for it, is what I'm saying. All right, we will be back tomorrow. Don't forget, text Eric to 33777. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere. And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.